All right. So, you know, uh, me and my, um, my down with the government homies um, are pouring one out tonight. Well, that's an interesting take, David. I like it. I like it. More spice, more zest. Uh, Marty, let's flip to you. What do you think? Got reaction? Uh, I was just terribly annoyed by the interruptions. Like, <laughs> it was just, uh, I think it was a, a beautiful microcosm of the state of uh, discourse in the America right now. And yeah, like echo what Nick said, it's uh, government run by old people are really out of touch and there's a bunch of empty platitudes and talking past each other and a lot more ad hominems and less uh, actual substance debate over ideas than, than you would imagine. Um, now I think, I, I forget who just tweeted it out, but we're at a stage where historians may look back in history and pinpoint the fall of the American import, uh, empire uh, maybe a couple of few years before now at some point and we're just chugging along with the clown show and I'm very very thankful that we have Bitcoin we can build alternative systems outside like, it's not productive at all what happened tonight I don't think yeah I think we can all agree that uh, everyone's clutching their hardware wallets a little bit closer tonight uh, it, it definitely felt like a a rough look that these are our two choices. Uh, that's my opinion anyway. Pierre, uh, let's jump over to you and welcome Colin. We'll, we'll jump to you next. Got reaction, Pierre. Yeah, I, I felt like it was a, a perfect reflection of the uh, current state of the United States. Uh, and frankly, like around the world, right? Um, I think that there's still kind of the same polarizing dynamic going on. Um, now, I, I also, in terms of uh, is this good or bad? Personally, I love politics as a spectator sport, so it was very entertaining and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, and and I wish that you know we would do this more often because uh, it's good to see people uh, clash. Um, now, uh, was it uh, an intellectual debate? No, not at all. Um, you know, calling your opponent, oh, that was just a lie. Right. So like if you were actually debating in like Lincoln Douglas debate or, or, you know, whatever kind of like formal debate format, if, if the judge heard you just say like as your counter argument, oh, that person just lied. Well, that's not a good counter argument. So that that would just get you disqualified and just kind of mocked as, as being stupid. Um, and so I don't know if the, if um, I don't know if Biden stooped down to Trump's level uh, as a kind of a deliberate ploy, or if actually he just doesn't have the brain cells to actually, you know, create like good counter arguments. So um, I think that, yeah, geriatrics, uh, it was, it, it was kind of reminded me of like something from South Park where uh, you have the old people with their walkers, like hitting each other or something. And, and people are just kind of finding it amusing in the same way you'd have like homeless people fighting each other or something. So I think the uh, data show that 45% of America coming into the debate thought that uh, Joe Biden has dementia. Um, after tonight, uh, am I alone in thinking that less of America thinks Joe Biden has dementia than thought it going in? Did he come off very dementia-y to y'all? I, I mean, he, I mean, he increased my conviction in him having dementia, but that's that might be confirmation bias. I, 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 thought, like I thought he held in there a little bit. I thought he held in pretty pretty well until the end. You could see, you could see it towards the end a little bit coming in, but I was actually kind of surprised at how well he delivered some of his like you know boilerplate uh, responses. But back to what Pierre was saying, yeah, he couldn't really like. I mean, you couldn't expect either of them to really formulate a, a, a counter argument because they both just lie all the time, and just like no one's really saying anything that matters. Like the, the the whole thing was just really kind of an incredible spectacle. Um, I mean, the fact that we get a debate like this, I don't know. It's a pretty special time, fellas. So you know, I was I was kind of hoping that tonight what would happen is like uh, Joe Biden would come out, he would show that he like literally had a, a mental cognitive issue, and and you know just landslide loss in in the uh, election. That scenario does not look like it's possible. This is going to be a contested election. This is going to get fucking messy. All right. What does the next 45 days look like? What happens 
to our financial system, what happens to consumer confidence, what happens to the economy if we literally have two months go by with a contested election and and both parties claiming victory. I mean, it's just like, that seems like a, a you know, um, a blockchain that doesn't got enough space on it. Well, then it seems like a pretty plausible, you know, uh, uh, path forward right now. Uh, I'd love to hear you guys' take on this. Uh, maybe Nick, let's start with you and then go to Colin. I don't know about whether the elections can be contested or not, but the only thing that we have control over is ourselves. So I think what Bitcoiners have to do here is obviously have most of their assets in Bitcoin. We already did that. Hey, um, here's to that. Cheers. cheers. But like that's a, that, you know, there's a very real reason behind that, which is that, you know, you hear about the hundred trillion dollars worth of spending, you know, for a green new deal, like the dollar is going to be plundered uh, regardless of who wins. The only things we can do here are arm ourselves legally, if you can, you know, lift weight, um, you know, get, regain touch with nature, um, work on our marketable skills, um, and uh, prepare ourselves for total chaos. And uh, th that's the only recipe here. Like no vote at the ballot box is going to change a single thing about the trajectory of this country. The only thing we have control over is ourselves and our families. So that's, we've, we've got some work to do over the next couple of months. What do you think, Colin? I think accelerationists are having a field day after this debate. Um, and I think that kind of to balance off what Nick is saying. So I was trying to say to my girlfriend earlier, cause she freaks out during these debates. It's really kind of susceptible to all the political, uh, histrionics and it's like the only thing you can really do is kind of prepare yourself the best way you can to be self-sufficient um you know i don't really foresee anything getting better um under under any presidency uh you know it's it's, it's kind of incredible that the choice is ultimately between trump and then biden because i don't know the like, like American politics is just completely flown off the rails. What, like, what, what do you even do to re, like, what do you even do with a debate like that? You get two more of them, you know, well, why don't they just stop them? Like, just cancel them. Like what, you know, like, I, I know I saw Niraj's tweet earlier about debates being a relic and, you know, I don't know what a Joe Rogan debate would look like, but something would be better than this. That was painful. That definitely was painful. You know, we, we all were uh, uh, cringing basically the entire way through it. I mean, it was, it was just very difficult from a, I would say even from an entertainment value. I mean, just very difficult to engage. Painful. Yeah. Painful. Uh, uh, so what do you, what do you think on this similar, similar vein, Marty? We'll go to American Hotel next and then here. Um, well, in terms of the contested election, I mean, I think tonight, towards the end of the debate, it became pretty obvious that both sides aren't going to uh, give much ground there. Uh, Republicans are convinced that uh, ballot footer fraud is going on, and uh, the Democrats are already positioning like they're not going to accept it as a legitimate vic victory, and that um, uh, the Republicans trying to prohibit ballot voter uh, ballot voting, excuse me, uh, is a reason to contest the election. So yeah, I think there could be a lot of chaos. There's already a lot of tension in the country right now. There's been a lot of violence over the last four months, particularly. Yeah, I'm, I would echo what Nick said. If it is contested, which I hope it does, sort of was hoping what uh, you were hoping, David, that tonight would prove uh, uh, that Trump was a more cognitive a uh, capable person to be president and that it would just be uh, a, a, a blowout, but that doesn't seem like it's going to be the case after tonight. Tonight was a complete shit show. And if that this pace continues into the election, it's not going to get any better. Uh, yeah, it's pretty shitty. Pierre, uh, what do you think? And, you know, also I'll throw in you know, as what, as Bitcoiners, you know, what is our duty in, in a time like this? Uh, if these, you know, pictures we're painting are accurate, you know, what should we 
be doing? Obviously, Nick gave some ideas of what we can be doing individually, but what can we do kind of as a, as a community? Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think that um, you mentioned that it was cringe and I love cringe humor. So it was right up my alley and I was <laughs> laughing the whole time. Um, I think that in terms of, you know, what's kind of within our locus of control, uh, I, I agree with what Nick was saying that, 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 that strikes me as the right path, uh, to go down. Um, and I also, I, I wonder like how much I, how much should I be involved with my local HOA? Like to me, they're kind of just a, a nuisance, right? I don't really want to deal with them at all. Um, but maybe it would be beneficial to start building local relationships. Um, but I, I try to like compare it to, well, do I want to build relationships on the internet with other Bitcoiners? And that actually strikes me as more constructive than even like my local physical environment. Maybe that's a, that's, that might be because of my own privilege, right? I'm in Texas. Like I don't really worry about uh, some of the stuff that's going on uh, in other parts of the country. Um, and I do think, though, that um, over, I don't know, over the years, my impression has been that political violence has kind of gotten normalized, right? Like where we see people fighting in the streets. Now, I don't know how much of that is because of like social media and people having camera phones and being able to broadcast this out to the world. And also that if you look historically, there has been way more political violence, obviously, in the past than there is uh, today. Um, so I want to get into a Stephen Pinker argument with Nick. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if things are getting worse or better because uh, it, you can always look back through the history books and find examples of things better and things worse. Um, but I think maybe we're kind of in the middle, right? Uh, and and that now's the tipping point. Which which way? Which way do we go? There's uh, uh, someone named Peter Turchin who uh, writes about civil unrest and, and political revolution and talks about how political unrest is really on a cycle. And uh, I think he says 50 year increments because that's basically two. Hey, look, th this goes back even further than that, dude. All right. It goes, they, it goes back to the Greeks. They talked about the Kyklos, K Y K, K L O S, right? The, the cycle. And there's a whole macro cycle to it. And we're in the middle of the kind of the democracy degenerating into mob rule cycle uh, part of the cycle. Um, after mob rule, uh, I think we get a dictator or a king. I don't know. I got to go look it up. Got to go brush up on my Greek cycle. Uh, it's not mythology because it really describes kind of the human condition. <laughs> um, and, and then we've got these generational cycles. Now, what I, what I do think that, let's bring it back to Bitcoin, um, I think that Bitcoin extricates the monetary part from the cycle and that that might help us attenuate the cycle uh, if sovereigns can no longer rely on the money to debase. Um, I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a really great point and uh, something that we've actually been talking about a little bit. Uh, and hey, Jeremy, how's it going? We'll get right over to you in a second. Uh, but until before we get there, uh, talking a little bit about one of the things Peter Churchin talks about is elite overproduction yeah. and that kind of leading to uh, a real power struggle between the top 1% kind of against each other. It's the 1% versus the 2%. Yeah. And, and, you know, what's interesting to me is uh, one aspect of the quantitative easing and the Cantillon effect is that it really directly leads to the overproduction of elites in a lot of ways. I mean, it's a direct kind of money faucet to the top 1%. Uh, to 2%. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there that it does seem like, you know, at the core, we are really dealing with a monetary and, and fiscal policy issue. Uh, and then, you know, everything else is almost just built on top of that fundamental flaw. Hey, well, I would say, uh, the, the correct way to pronounce his name is, is Cantillon. So if you mispronounce that, that's a microaggression. Just heads up. Cantillon, I've been getting. That's actually Can great. Hear me? We've always no, no, it doesn't sound right. Uh, we're we're using the redneck pronunciation. It's um. Can't feel it. Oh yeah, I'll get yeah. that. Uh, if you're using the redneck, get that Cajun out then. It's French. Come on now. Quesadillas. Uh, but Jeremy, Can, Jeremy, let's go to you. Uh, welcome to the Can show. Can y'all hear me? 
Yep, we can hear you. Okay, sweet. Uh, can you see me? Are we good? Just want to make sure. You're good, you're good. Uh, let's go ahead and get your kind of gut reaction to what happened. And also, do you see the next 45 days as contentious as we're kind of seeing it? Uh, I think that was a route. I, I think it was an absolute route. I think the Trump campaign, I'm mixing the drinks, sorry. I think the Trump campaign set standards too low. Um, and even if they didn't, I think Biden would have won there. Like, like Trump just can't win on the COVID issue and his answers are stupid. But like, it's just not, it, it, it sets him up for a loss. And I, I think the Trump campaign decided to make a play and they bought their own propaganda about like, Biden not being able to carry a thought. And the plan was Trump is going to sit on Biden in the first 30 minutes and really throw him off. And it just didn't work. And then Wallace had to step in. So now you're going to see Wallace or Wallace be like the, the guy who gets put on the cross and the right is going to say that Wallace fucked that up. And I don't think it happened. But like, I think, I think Wallace did fine. I think the Trump campaign made a play and I just don't think it worked. And I would have made the same play, honestly. But like with what I saw from Biden in the weeks leading up to this, I would have made the exact same play. I would have just had Trump run gut shot over him, try and throw him off. And like, I would have lost too. Um, also, I want to say, I, 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 would, I, I agree with your point about uh, monetary policy. I think it is an issue with monetary policy and a lack of fiscal policy. Because you have fiscal policy to funnel money to the bottom, you actually don't have as much of this issue. But Congress doesn't work anymore, so you only have monetary policy. And all monetary policy can do is change for interest rates and give, like, like change bond rates for for rich people to borrow. You can't actually funnel money to the bottom. So, I, I would say this is a monetary with lack of fiscal issue. That's a that's an interesting take, uh, Nick. Would you agree? Well, um, it's been interesting to see like the like Fintwit, um, you know, thought leader class bemoaning the lack of fiscal and uh, they, ha they have been doing that, that, you know, they got what they wanted uh, from the monetary side, obviously, but they weren't satisfied with the fiscal response. Everyone's pissed that Congress hasn't approved more direct handouts to individuals, um, which really like speaks to the complete degeneration of this country. I mean, if like the economy is dependent on the government, you know, literally handing money out to individuals, then effectively that just entails government capture and takeover of the economy. And Chamath said this recently, he said government spending now represents 55% of GDP. Like, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, Hayek said that there's a problem of knowledge uh, and uh, you can't just, um, centrally plan an economy which is literally what everybody's advocating for now with this I, aggressive fiscal handout so i, I don't know strongly disagree I strongly i'd love to see disagree. i'd love to see it, someone make the point that you can centrally plan an economy because 55 percent seems a little high to me it's a straw man you're absolutely straw man um, do you disagree with the, the facts at hand do you disagree no, no, with i the disagree facts? with your framing of what you're saying well, with the framing here uh, the what fraction that, of the what fraction of GDP should the government mind, spending account do you, for? Do you mind if I respond without you strawmanning? Is that answer cool? the question? Cool? What fraction? Tell uh, me a fraction. Is it cool if I respond without you strawmanning? Like, can I can I respond to what you're saying? Is that yeah, cool? I'd love to hear your answer. Yeah, All right. Jeremy, let's is that okay? Let's hear what you say. Um, so the idea, so so what I would say has happened here is because of the monetary policy. Um, if you look at what banks are incentivized to do. If I lower interest rates as the Fed, what banks are incentivized to do is give out uh, high percentage return loans, high percentage payback loans. And in an economy where you suck the money out from the bottom of the economy, high percentage return loans, uh, like your highest percentage paybacks are loaning to companies to rebuy stock. So you've totally put all of the money at the top of the economy to say like, adding fiscal policy into that monetary policy to move money from the top to the bottom of the economy is central planning is kind of ridiculous because monetary policy has already moved the money to the top. Like you already have a oil and water situation where you've separated all the money to the top and you need fiscal policy to move it to the bottom. 
And that's not. I, I just want to point out that monetary policy, U.S. monetary policy, runs the global monetary regime. It affects people in every country, on every, on all across. Yeah, the of course, because we're the, the only ones with positive interest. Really, something that just benefits American individuals. It's tiny in relation to the effect that monetary policy has on all the people living in the world. It's like two different planes of of important sure but we're not we just watched the u.s presidential election like we're 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 so if you separate the u.s economy like so so what you're saying is so europe has negative interest rates right so european banks are only floating because the u.s has positive interest rates because banking doesn't work if there's negative interest rates like they are all funding funneling through u.s treasuries the whole plan is that's why the u.s fed is basically acting as the fed for everybody um, so like, I, I mean, I kind of feel you, but I was making a point against the, the idea that, that if you have one side of your policy, your monetary policy, which is funneling money to the top and you don't have your fiscal side, which redirects it to the bottom to flow up, like the idea that you can do this part and not do this part because this part is central planning is ridiculous. You're, like, like, you're we're already central planning. You're just compounding shitty central planning, though, at that point. My That's question is, where does the buck stop? Like, when do you stop effectively with the bread and circuses? When do you stop with the direct you handouts don't. to individuals? So it's normalized and now that's just policy. Well, no, you don't because you're in late stage, you're in a later stage of capitalism where capital is concentrated. So unless you want to do like a, like a, uh, very focused. Hey, how's the, hey, Jeremy, how's the yield farming going, bro? Is it going well? Hey, so, so let's, so, let's not, let's not get distracted. Uh, uh, yeah. So y'all have like, no, no, y'all have super cunt on. I'm done. Audio. No, Peace no. out. So yeah. let's, let's keep on. Uh, what was that? All right. Otto, why'd you have to do that, man? We were having a great civil debate. I'm sorry. Okay, so no, it was sorry. a fair we're point about the yield farming. Uh, uh, we got a little bit off topic going into the monetary policy. Uh, uh, it's on us. We're, we're the, the uh, Chris in this debate, so uh, we're going to keep moving the, the conversation forward now. Uh, let's talk a little bit about... I'm, I'm mean Chris, though, and you're nice Chris. Yeah, I, I'm the smiley Chris. I, I feel like up? I didn't get a word in on the fiscal policy. Okay, I was on. being polite. I was not interrupting. I was just being polite over here, and, and I get true. dinged for it. Don't want to ding you for that. Go ahead. All here. right. Well, so I, I think that like the, the synthesis is that um, like if fiscal policy could be specifically engineered the way Jeremy was talking about, then hypothetically, you know, he might have a valid point. But the reality is that fiscal stimulus gets captured by a special interest group. And that is really kind of what public choice economics is all about, is looking at, all right, like day to day, what's actually going to happen with the lobbyists and the Congress people and the voters and the bureaucracies, et cetera. And so that's where like, okay, Jeremy might have these grand plans, right? And that's always kind of what central planners have is they've got grand plans and it, they've all drawn it out. They're gonna give money to people who need it and they're gonna take money from people who don't need it. Um, but then when it meets reality, what you have is a bunch of vultures that descend upon your fiscal policy and pick it apart. And they do it, whether it's tax loopholes, right? Trump's gotten a lot of criticism for all the real estate tax loopholes. Guess what? Those real estate tax loopholes were bipartisan, right? They came in from all directions of uh, people trying to grift. And I think that uh, that's where um, the, the idealism is great on paper, but in practice it gets co-opted and corrupted. And, and that's why I, I like Bitcoin a lot. So I'll just leave it there. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I mean, I think, I think you make a really good point. Uh, and I think we're at that stage right now, right? Where the vultures are kind of descending on picking apart kind of the, the remnants of an economy that needs to have. It just doesn't sit right with me, though, that the criticism is like, you know, uh, you know, the ultimate special interest group is the American citizen, right? And it's like, it's not, it's really not. More, it's, what, we, no, we, because we, you have the problem of uh, 
diluted cost with concentrated benefit, right? So if it only costs everyone five pennies and it makes one person a millionaire or a billionaire, then guess what? That one person is going to lobby all day long oh, I know, in Congress. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, is the millionaire in this equation is the U.S. citizen who's making a $50,000 uh, GDP per capita versus someone who's living in a third world country that is living on the U.S. dollar regime. And right, but the they're, they're making that, the they're making that 50K of, per capita despite the corruption in the system, the not because of it. And so the U.S. is definitely ahead of a lot of countries in terms of rule of law and property rights and whatnot. And I say that because I come from France, uh, but it's it's certainly not perfect. And I think that if you kind of do some comparative analysis, it becomes clear that, OK, the U.S. is ahead not because of whatever the federal government's doing, but despite. That's a good point. Uh, Marty, I know you were trying to jump in earlier. Do you want to add in? No, I'm pretty bummed that Jeremy left. I would have uh, liked to expand on that conversation with, but no, I, I think. Do you, uh, do you think Joe Biden wanted to leave in the middle of the debate? I, I think. I, who would have tapped out probably first? Probably not. He's doing, he's doing pretty well. I think I would have tapped. I didn't, I'm so, I, listen, I apologize if I but, ruined it. I didn't. I didn't think that was that mean. Yeah, I didn't. The point I was trying to make was, yeah, you're just compounding shitty decisions at that point, and. I mean, I'm a strong believer in that you can't micromanage a complex system like the U.S. economy, and to uh, add, to uh, do that successfully via fix, fiscal policy means directing funds directly to what the government would deem as a winner, and that just just not ever turned out to actually work in practice. So, yeah, I just to add to that, I mean, like. Isn't that like the most basic principle of what we believe in as Bitcoiners, as like free market enthusiasts, that you can't plan a complex system as big as the 20 trillion US economy? Like, if you could, it would be great. We wouldn't need markets. We wouldn't need firms. The government would just like issue dollars and give everyone a living wage. No, and we wouldn't we would just competition or anything. It'd be great. No. Yeah, there, maybe there wouldn't even wages. We would just all make widgets and exchange them with our neighbors. <laughs> But like that's never worked. It's a computationally impossible problem. So it's incredibly conceited to claim that the government can just like reverse this ship and, you know, make correct decisions about where to allocate funds in the economy. And I never hear anything about where the buck stops and like where this ends. No, and you know, to add to that, I agree with Jeremy at this point. Like monetary policy is pushing all the wealth to the top. I completely agree with that. I just don't think the... It, it, fiscal policy only reinforces it. Or, or you know, there's other, there's other cantillionaires who emerge through fiscal policy. Uh, and and the other part, like, like you, we were talking about earlier in terms of, like, the average American voter buying their vote can be very inexpensive. And so, like, you figure out, okay what what little clientele can i build up in buying their vote um and i feel like that was kind of the the twelve hundred dollars with coronavirus was kind of like all right can we at least buy you to not vote against us it was kind of not even they, they weren't going for you know voting for them uh it was just like okay can you just not like overthrow the government right away <laughs> No, I mean, well, once, I, it was got very close to having its moment in this corona, coronavirus um, chaos. I mean, it was close. Everyone was talking about it, yeah. Uh, uh, Colin, you've been kind of quiet recently. Do you have anything you want to add here before we kind of move on to the next topic? Well, I don't know. What do you want me to comment on? Just how the uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy, uh, all of that in terms of this uh, election. I don't know. I kind of want Jeremy to come back and wave the MMT flag a little bit more. It was, it was watching his eyes float around while he was working out those problems in his head. Problems in his head. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, ultimately it's it's the impossible problem, but uh, you gotta you gotta appreciate the people who want to try and solve it uh, in the way that we've set it up because we've set it up in a broken way at its core. So, I mean, I, I get where everyone's coming from, honestly. Um, well, so so. So I, I do want to take a moment, though, because I want to thank Jeremy. We now have an odd number of people on this call. 
And so one of the one of the items that we have to uh, work through on the agenda tonight is crowning an official uh, winner of tonight's debate. Um, this is being crowned by the official Bitcoin Magazine award winner of the 2020 presidential debate. It's a big award. It's huge. Uh, it's, huge. it's huge. So uh, I want to just go one by one and just uh, officially assign who won tonight. I'll start. Uh, I think that Joe Biden won the debate tonight. Nick, we'll go to you. Does it have to be one of the candidates? No, you can say Bitcoin. Yeah, seriously, can I abstain? Like, no, Bitcoin's right. too easy. Bitcoin's too easy. Um, <laughs> oh, man, now I look like I'm the dumb one, but keep going. I can't say mine. It's I can't say mine. It's too 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 dark Stay and out. subversive. <laughs> Stay out. Is it even um, legal to say? <laughs> The winner of this debate is anybody that was like seriously considering seceding uh, from the United States and forming a more perfect union. Mars real estate, it's booming. Yeah. Colin, what do you think? Who won? I mean, kind of, I just want to comment on, I don't know, I don't know, Nick, if you're playing on this, but Trump legit told the Proud Boys to stand down and stand by. So I think the Proud Boys are the real winners of this debate, honestly. Like the fact that they literally got a shout out from the president. Um, but honestly, I don't know if I can really comment. You know, um, I think that maybe Biden, just by the nature of the fact that like Trump just could not shut up and could not stop talking over him. Um, and I do agree with Jeremy, like the, 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 you know, tactics seem to be just jab after jab after jab and Biden just kind of stood there and tried to reply some. Um, but, you know, I don't even know if I can say that Biden won it because honestly, uh, you know, if you really, if Trump really wanted to press him on some issues on some like longer form stuff, like, I don't know if Biden could actually legitimately uh, formulate a coherent response. Um, he was definitely fading towards the end of the debate, but he did a lot better than I was expecting him to, which is not saying a lot. All right. So that means Biden. Eh, I'm abstaining. <laughs> all right, all right, Pierre, let's go to you. Who do you think won? Uh, I, I yeah. So I think net uh, Trump won. Uh, and really, the only argument I have to substantiate that is that Trump looked younger than Biden. Uh, that was really the only thing that stood out to me is why why I would pick one winner over the other. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously it's because of, of his makeup or his, like me, you know, he oranges himself, uh, and, um, and, and he dyes his hair like I do as well. Uh, and, and so that's why he, he won, I think. Well, he uses the, the bright lights before he goes on stage. You use them while you're streaming. So it's a difference, but, but you're both using the lights, huh? Yeah, well, I carry the lights around with me, you know, and I carry the orange paste around with me. And I really, I'm all, that's why I'm on board with Bitcoin, right? It's the orange coin good. And the other part is that the old libertarians used to drink silver and they would turn blue. And I'm kind of reacting against that, right? The colloidal silver uh, cure. And, and I think Bitcoin is the cure, not silver. And you should turn orange. Bitcoin's a silver bullet. You heard it here first. We need All to right. turn Bitcoin into an elixir somehow. First. <laughs> uh, Rodolfo Novak will know how to do that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right, let's go to you, American Hodel. Who do you think won tonight? You know who won this debate? Uh, Metamucil, Murder, She Wrote, AARP Magazine, Crossword Puzzle. Um, <laughs> what else? <laughs> <laughs> Prune juice won this debate. Um, probably have to give it to Biden because Trump came off sort of deranged and insane. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't think it was a win for Trump. It, it was a win in the beginning and then he lost steam at the end. So Biden won. All right. All right. Marty, who do you think won? Uh, yeah, I think just based off. Uh, expectations go again they're very low for joe all he had to do was not uh, forget where he was on stage and he did that successfully and, uh, like they were mentioning earlier like trump could have let him hang himself if he just didn't interrupt like i, I like the strategy was to 
hope that he he would have had a mental lapse in uh, coherence and you should have let him talk longer and the interruption just made him look like an asshole number one and then uh very unpresidential america america lost biden won tonight i guess you could say fair answer and david who do you think won um you know uh, i i definitely have to give the most brazen moment to trump when he um when he criticized biden for giving him the massive uh tax refund and uh, then he, he then he accentuated that point by by pointing out that the person who wrote him the check got fired. Uh, I don't know who he was trying to criticize in that moment, um, but uh, that was the most brazen moment. Uh, but I, I have to give um, the win tonight to Biden as much as that pains me. Um, and you know I'm hoping that this is really just 4D chess, and 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 Trump's really just building up for a more dramatic uh, season finale of this election. Um, that's my hope. That's my hope. I also want to point out, uh, if Hunter Biden, if you're listening, uh, if you had taken that money in Bitcoin, uh, uh, it wouldn't have been subject of tonight's debate. So um, next time, think ahead, uh, respect the family, take your bribes in Bitcoin. It's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, well, guys, so I think that means officially uh, Bitcoin Magazine declares that Joe Biden won the first presidential debate. Uh, crazy crazy uh breaking news um so we'll get that graphic i'm sure posted somewhere uh but yeah. how, how will you guys be held accountable when biden loses the general election that's my question are there oh, any dlcs involved are you guys signing anything what's going on we have no accountability at this company it's a strict company policy so um oh good possible, me too we'll me too ahead. perfect uh we'll have as much accountability as uh, as russia did for last the last election um but yeah, so I mean, uh, it would be fun to do like a DLC. Uh, I know we were talking about that in, in office about like, you know, finding a way. We wanted to be the, the Oracle for the DLC. Uh, we didn't want to necessarily uh, put our money where our mouth is because at this point, we're just along for the ride with everyone market else. Market makers, we're market makers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're the truth seekers, right? Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, we're running up on about how much time we have. Yeah, I, I, I do want to just say, I want our elite class to know that just because you scored one tonight for the record books, all right, we're coming for you. We're coming for your money printing machine. All right, and we're <laughs> gonna take that motherfucker away from you guys. And no amount of money printing is gonna be able to pump you up with enough Adderall to survive any debate, all right? So on that note, Bitcoin Magazine will give Biden the official presidential debate winner role, but it's with an asterisk, all right? It's with an asterisk. I think you could just sound a little bit more begrudging there, but we'll, we'll take the we'll take. The well, answer. you know, the the biggest qualifier is that they excluded the libertarian candidate, right? So already we can just uh, say that it's not a fair result. I, I, you know, Brock being on that stage really would have added some zest to the night. I just got to say, some young blood. I'm sorry, who? Uh, what? Brock who? Pierce. Don't know him. What, what's up with the libertarian candidate getting bit by a bat? Like, what the fuck? Could you be any more oh, of a weirdo? Man. What happened? I'm sorry, I, I missed this. She got bit by a bat, and she was like, fuck, now I can't do president stuff. I don't know. Oh, Hasn't that happened to all of us? I, what, I'm sorry, she, what's the problem? <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm out of here. Make Bitcoin great again. I'll see y'all election night. This is not over. This is not over. All right. All right. Watch out for the That was the, the David final word, but uh, we'll go ahead and go around and give everyone else one final word before we sign off. Uh, let's start with Nick. Go ahead, final word. All right. I'm going to level with you all. I've never voted. I'm eligible to vote in two countries, and I've never voted. That's double never voting. That's like real commitment to rejecting suffrage. And uh, I'm going to continue to not vote because voting is the lowest leverage political activity you can possibly do. The way to vote is with your wallet through Bitcoin and through building companies that express your political views and through building your local community. Um, so in conclusion, I strongly look forward to not voting again this election and continue to do 
like otherwise important political shit through other means, like writing Bitcoin propaganda on the internet. Well, thank you, Nick. And we can't wait to not see you at the polls. Uh, let's go on to Colin. Colin, final word. Well, I don't really know, man. I don't really want to see two more debates like that. I'm kind of just going to be happy when the election is over. Uh, I think everyone just gets at each other and everyone I know in my life who subscribe to one party or the next is just so on edge during this time. And everyone is just, I don't know. I'm going to go home during, uh, during Thanksgiving and just, you know, if Trump loses, I'm going to get an earful from my entire family about the leftist plague that's going to destroy America. And if Biden win or if Trump wins, then from all my leftist friends, they think that Trump's going to round them up and put them in concentration camps. So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, I honestly, after this debate, have no idea who's going to win the election. I think that Trump's kind of taught us that you can't really even, you can't trust polls, you can't trust anything. So um, go vote if you want to. And uh, just don't be pissed off if the person you want to win doesn't win. Stop putting your trust in demagogues, God damn it. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's very good advice. And uh, uh, it's definitely gonna be something to watch. I mean, I don't think any of us really know what's gonna happen next. Uh, American Hodel, do you wanna go next? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm disgusted in watching Grumpy Old Men, the sequel up there tonight. And I also am going to stick to not voting, even though I have money on the election. Uh, at this point though, I'm just hoping I don't lose to Peter McCormack because that would fucking suck. Cause he's just going to have that stupid British accent and just be like, Oh, one might fucking, yeah, I can't do a British accent, but it's going to be really annoying if I lose to Peter McCormack on the flip side though. If Trump wins, even if there are concentration camps, I have half of Peter McCormack's Bitcoin. That's pretty good. That's a good outcome, you know? So. That's fair. I mean, it sounds like it's uh, uh, you win either way. So uh, that's, a, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, Pierre, let's go to you. Final word. Yeah, uh, I'm going to vote straight libertarian down the ticket um, just so that I get put in the right FEMA camp. Um, and then, uh, I guess I will, um, yeah, stack more sats. Uh, there's not really anything else to do. Fair enough. Fair enough. And Marty, close us out. Uh, yeah, message to anybody who may be on the fence on whether or not you know, the United States presidential election is still legitimate or the nominees are in any way legitimate. Like, if tonight doesn't persuade you that, uh, putting a, a bunch of time and effort into this particular system isn't worth it anymore. Like, I don't know what will save you. Uh, beyond that, uh, yeah, I mean, stack sets. And uh, I actually do have a podcast dropping tomorrow with Cynthia Lummis from uh, Wyoming. And she's actually a more articulate politician that actually has a bright uh, view of the future with Bitcoin included in it. So if you wanna hear from a politician, you can actually articulate thoughts uh, I highly recommend looking out for that podcast. Cynthia 2024, it's going to happen. Yes. Well, uh, well, Marty, thank you for ending it on the rare bright spot of the whole night, I guess. Uh, so really appreciate that. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you guys for jumping on, on the panel. This was an excellent, excellent conversation and it got a little spicy. We always enjoy that. Uh, and until next time, stay humble, stack sats, uh, and we'll catch you guys on the